Soon after the beginning of the Civil War, this balloon ascent by Thaddeus Lowe near the Smithsonian Institution in Washington convinced President Lincoln and military leaders of the advantages of aerial observations in wartime. I am Paul Garber, historian emeritus and Ramsey associate of the Smithsonian Institution. These binoculars belong to Thaddeus Lowe, the chief aeronaut of the Northern Armies in the Civil War. They were given to the museum by his daughter. Looking through these, he and the observers who accompanied him observed the operations of the Confederate armies and then telegraphed their reports to the commanding officers. Here is Professor Lowe, about to leave camp and go to his balloon, which was located several hundred yards away, so that the sparks from soldiers' campfires would not ignite the flammable hydrogen gas in the balloon bag. Note that the binoculars that I showed you are hanging from his right side. In his left hand, he holds his barometer in a leather case. Thaddeus Lowe was not the first aeronaut to serve in the Northern Army. Prior to the Civil War, Balloon ascents had been a popular attraction at carnivals and other events, and there were a number of brave and enterprising men, both North and South, who were professional aeronauts. With the outbreak of war, several of them offered their services to their respective armies. The distinction of being the first aeronaut in the Northern Army belongs to James Allen of Rhode Island, who left Providence with the 1st Rhode Island Regiment and his two balloons four days after President Lincoln issued his first call for troops. On June 9, 1861, one of Allen's balloons was inflated with coal gas in Washington, and he made a demonstration ascent from the camp of his regiment north of the city. The second aeronaut with the Northern Army was John Wise, whom you met in the previous film. He was asked by the chief of the Topographical Corps of the Army to serve as an aeronaut and to submit a design and estimate for making a military balloon. Following careful consideration of requirements, Wise submitted a price of $850 and volunteered his personal services. The contract was awarded to him. He completed the balloon on July 16, 1861, and delivered it to Washington three days later. Thus, this became the first military aircraft ever designed for and purchased by the United States Army. John Wise included the feature that we continue to use in military aircraft of today, armor. Here you see Professor Wise supervising the placing of a plate of sheet iron in the bottom of the basket as protection from anti-aircraft fire. With the Confederate armies threatening Washington, both Wise and Allen were ordered to have their balloons inflated at the gas works in Washington and take them across the Potomac to the Federal Army's outposts. The balloons were towed by ground troops, but en route, both balloons were so badly torn by the branches of trees that the gas escaped and they became useless. When criticized by an army officer for failure to deliver his balloon for use at the Battle of Bull Run, Wise commented that the balloon part was just about as good as the fighting part. You'll recall that the North lost that battle, which was fought July 21, 1861. Three days later, Thaddeus Lowe made his first military ascent when he reported with his inflated balloon, Enterprise, at the camp of General Irvin McDowell near Arlington, Virginia. There, Lowe made a free ascent, that is, without any tethering lines attached. He rose about three and a half miles, quite out of range of Confederate fire, and observed that although there were large massed operations of the Confederate infantry and cavalry about 30 miles distant from Washington, there was no concentrated movement toward the nation's capital. Valving gas and descending, he found an air current that carried him back toward the Union lines. But there he was fired at by Northern troops who thought he was a Confederate balloonist. Rising again, he came down in an open field behind the Confederate lines, being slightly injured in the landing. Mrs. Lowe, who had been anxiously scanning the sky, saw his returning balloon and the direction of his descent. With the assistance of some men from the 31st New York Volunteer Regiment, he was located. Mrs. Lowe, who had obtained a horse and wagon, helped him put the deflated balloon and basket in the wagon. Covering him with the balloon cloth and evading Confederate pickets, she drove to federal headquarters, where Lowe's reports allayed the fears in the capital city. 
At Fortress Monroe in Virginia, the Union troops were surrounded by Confederate units. General Benjamin Butler, in command, needed to know where the enemy forces were, how large they were, and what they were doing. Butler wrote to the aeronaut John LaMountain in Troy, New York, emphasizing the need for aerial observation. LaMountain came promptly and made several ascents, being able to observe enemy operations within a radius of 30 miles. His reports and sketches gave General Butler an accurate knowledge of the location and strength of troops in the vicinity. On August 3, 1861, for the first time in the history of the world, a man-carrying aircraft was launched from the deck of a vessel for a military operation. This was when LaMountain's balloon was carried on board of the Federal Armed Transport Fanny, which then steamed out into Hampton Roads, Virginia. With the aeronaut in the basket, the balloon was let out from the stern, rising about 2,000 feet, where LaMountain observed the construction of a formidable Confederate battery from which the guns could be aimed at Fortress Monroe or at shipping. This is a copy of a sketch made from his balloon for General Butler. The Fanny then steamed to several other points of vantage, demonstrating the versatility of the combination of watercraft with aircraft. We realize this today with our Navy's aircraft carriers. Five factors limited the use of balloons with the armies. First was the weather. Second was the inexperience of the ground crews, which were assigned from whatever unit happened to be in the area, but seldom were permitted to remain long enough to acquire the necessary experience for handling the balloons properly. Third was the failure of commanding officers to use the balloons efficiently. Fourth was the difficulty of transporting the inflated balloons over the narrow roads. And fifth was the need to keep the balloons adequately inflated. During the first part of the war, balloons were usually filled at the gas works in the nearest city where that service was available. When the gas from one balloon had leaked out so much that it could not rise, it could sometimes be made serviceable by nursing it from another balloon that was partly filled. The photograph here was taken during a critical time at the Battle of Seven Pines in Virginia. There was urgent need for some means of filling the balloons and keeping them filled at the places where they were in use. Early in the war, when Secretary Henry of the Smithsonian Institution was asked to give his opinion on the value of balloons in warfare, he recommended the development of a portable hydrogen gas generator. He and Thaddeus Lowe discussed this at length. Here is a sketch made by them in Secretary Henry's office. The generator had a strong wooden tank in which a quantity of iron or zinc granules or shavings were covered with water into which sulfuric acid was then poured, generating hydrogen gas. The gas then flowed into a cooling tank and next into a purifying tank and was then pumped into the balloon. This is the completed equipment as constructed at the Washington Navy Yard. The portable gas generator made possible the first aircraft carrier. Here is a scale model of that first carrier. Let me clarify its identity. The Fanny used at Hampton Roads was a transport vessel, and the only equipment added for the elevation of the balloon was a winch and line on its stern. But the vessel represented by this scale model was modified extensively from waterline to top side and also below deck for balloon operations. Thaddeus Lowe had requested such a vessel from the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells. The Navy bought a coal barge for $150. Under Lowe's supervision, Washington Navy Yard carpenters constructed a deck with hatches for going below where equipment was stowed. The vessel was named for the step-grandchild of our first president, the George Washington Park Custis. It had no power of its own, but was towed to each place of use. The vessel was very valuable in the Union Army in the fall of 1861. Here it is at Bud's Ferry on the Potomac. In the spring of 1862, it accompanied the Balloon Corps during the campaign to the Chesapeake and toward Richmond. The Balloon Washington was one of seven that by this time were operating with the Army under Lowe's direction. Eight skilled aeronauts served with him, including Ebenezer Seaver at left and John Starkweather. Others were Lever, Dickinson, Paulin, Steiner, Mason, and Frano. As McClellan's army approached Richmond, and particularly at the Battle of Fair Oaks where this photograph was taken, showing the portable gas generators in use, observations from the balloons were most valuable. Here, that fierce battle is illustrated in a Courier and Ives print. 
Note the balloon in the upper left corner. Major General A.W. Greeley later wrote, the Union Army was saved from destruction at the Battle of Fair Oaks, May 31 to June 1, 1862, by the frequent and accurate reports of Professor Lowe. Balloon observers provided important services. Artillery fire was directed, corrections being made for range and deflection until the shots were hitting the target. On numerous occasions, officers, telegraphers, or topographic artists ascended with Lowe to make personal observations and prepare sketches and reports for the commanders. Lowe developed a brilliant calcium light for illuminating night operations. Often he supplemented the telegraph reports by written descriptions and sketches after returning to Earth. The Confederates also used balloons. Some were of the hot air type. Hydrogen was used occasionally, but the Southern Army was hampered by lack of materials. The most famous Confederate balloon was popularly known as the silk dress balloon, because it was reportedly made from silk dresses donated by the ladies of the, of the South. Actually, it was made from pieces of silk of various patterns, probably intended for silk dresses. The constructor was Captain Langdon Cheeves, Jr. of Savannah, who served as its aeronaut at the battles of Gaines Mill and Malvern Hill, defending Richmond successfully. On July 4, 1862, while ascensions were being made from the deck of a small Confederate tugboat, the tug ran aground and a large Federal tug captured both the boat and the balloon. Thaddeus Lowe, whose observation from his balloon had assisted in the capture, obtained this piece of the balloon as a souvenir and it was later given to the Smithsonian by his family. General George McClellan used Lowe's balloons frequently and intelligently during his campaigns, but after McClellan was replaced during the interval between the major campaigns of 1862 and 1863, his successors were not as well acquainted with the usefulness of aerial observations and made changes which were distasteful to Lowe. His pay was reduced from $10 a day to $6, and he was subjected to unnecessary and humiliating discipline. His father, Clovis Lowe, concerned for the welfare of his son and being anxious to do his bit in the war, came to help. Here, the aeronaut is showing his father one of his plans for signaling from the balloon. After the Battle of Chancellorsville, when Lowe was stricken with fever, he resigned. For a while, James Allen maintained charge of the Balloon Corps, but then he, too, gave up this responsibility. The statement by the Confederate General, E.P. Alexander, is particularly pertinent. He wrote, I have never understood why the enemy abandoned the use of military balloons early in 1863, after having used them extensively up to that time. Even if the observers never saw anything, they would have been worth all they cost for the annoyance and delay they caused us in trying to keep our movements out of their sight. The next important use of balloons in warfare occurred during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71. But that was principally a postal operation to enable persons in besieged Paris to send mail beyond the Prussian lines. I will therefore describe those events when we come to the subject of air mail later in this series. Another important use of aircraft is in exploration. The attempt by Andre and his two companions to reach the North Pole by air in 1897 is an outstanding example. Solomon August Andre of Sweden became interested in ballooning early in life. This interest was intensified when he came to the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, 1876, and there met the famous aeronaut John Wise. In 1895, at a meeting of the Swedish Academy of Sciences, Andre announced his plan for a North Polar Expedition by balloon. The first person to contribute toward the expenses was Alfred Nobel, inventor of dynamite, from whose fortune the Nobel Prizes are awarded. In June of 1896, the Andre Expedition left Gothenburg, Sweden, aboard the freighter Virgo. They put in at several ports, as shown by the dotted line on this map. Their destination was Spitsbergen, which is east of northern Greenland. The Virgo anchored on the north side of Dane Island, where the hangar for the balloon was erected and the hydrogen gas generator was assembled. By the end of July, the balloon, named the Eagle, and of 176,000 cubic feet gas capacity, was inflated and the car packed. But the weather continued unsuitable, with the wind blowing from the wrong directions. Finally, by mid-August, the attempt for that year was canceled and the expedition returned home. An earlier schedule was followed the next year, 
and before the end of June, the balloon was again ready. One of Andre's companions for the voyage was Niels Strindberg, an outstanding student in physics and chemistry, and an expert photographer. The other companion was Newt Frankel, a sportsman, athlete, and civil engineer. Both of them had been preparing themselves for the voyage by making balloon ascents at Paris. On July 11, 1897, with the wind blowing from the south-southwest, the walls of the hangar were dismantled and the balloon rose with the aeronauts. For a few moments, it lost altitude and the car dipped into the water. But with the release of ballast, it rose to about 1,600 feet and later to 2,000 feet. All that afternoon and evening, it headed northeastward, but by midnight, the wind had changed and the balloon was blown westward. The temperature was just below freezing. During the afternoon of the second day, the weather became foggy, this moisture freezing on the balloon bag. During the night, it moved slowly, bumping occasionally on the ice. The next morning, the sun warmed the gas and the balloon rose, blown by a northwesterly wind. But by mid-afternoon, the fog was again dense the ice forcing the balloon down. They jettisoned everything that could be spared, and for a while they rose again. But by midnight, they were once more on the ice, this time to stay. They had been in the balloon for 65 hours, coming down 180 miles from the nearest land and about 500 miles from the North Pole. None of the details of the voyage were known to the world at that time, except for a brief message brought by a carrier pigeon which alighted on the yard of a ship and some short notes found in two buoys that drifted ashore. The fate of these three men remained a mystery for 33 years. Then, in 1930, the vessel Bratvog, on a combined hunting and scientific voyage, hove to off White Island. Members of the crew went ashore for a walrus hunt, and there found the remains of Andre's camp. From the diaries found near the aeronauts' bodies, and from the films which were developed and printed after 33 years, it was possible to learn of the trials experienced by these brave men and to draw a map of their routes, both in the balloon and afterward, when they were dragging their sledges over the broken and shifting ice for 83 days. From White Island, they could probably have seen, on clear days, Spitsbergen, the island whence they had started. If they could have reached that shore, they might have been able to go overland to civilization, but that was not to be. Examinations indicated that they had succumbed to the effects of contaminated food, probably polar bear meat. From the very start of ballooning, there were numerous instances when aeronauts wanted to direct the course of their travel, but instead were carried in whichever direction the wind was blowing. This was especially true of the Andre expedition the distance which his balloon traveled through the air, if it had been proceeding in a straight line, would have extended to the North Pole. During the Franco-Prussian War, there were other instances of balloons being blown away from their intended courses. Two were lost at sea, and one went as far as Norway. Soon after the invention of the balloon, there were some fanciful ideas as to how they might be propelled and steered. Muscular power and harnessed birds were suggested. Blanchard and Lunardi had tried to row their balloons with large oars, but without success. As early as 1785, a far-sighted concept of a dirigible, this word means steerable, balloon was originated by the French general, J.B.M. Munier. He planned for an elongated bag that would pass through the air more easily than a round one, the suspension of the car from a wide band, the maintaining of the gas bag's taut shape by use of an inner ballonet kept pumped up with air. Propulsion was to be by three propellers, which, no mechanical engines being available at that time, were to be rotated by manpower. Although this concept was never constructed, it influenced later designers. Sir George Cayley of England had several ideas for construction and operation of airships. This is his design of 1817. At the left, in a front view, he proposes the use of screw propellers. But in the side view, he pictures what he called flappers, which would have been less efficient. He had a rudder for steering. Another method of steering an aircraft considered by Cayley was to pivot a plane between two balloons, the upper one containing hydrogen the lower one, a hot air balloon, the fire being in the car below. 
With the top balloon providing two-thirds of the lift, heating the air in the lower balloon would make the craft rise. Tilting the plane would cause the craft to make a slanting climb. The motion being forward as well as upward, the rudder at the rear would steer the craft at angles to the wind. By reversing the tilt of the plane and valving out the heated air, the craft would go downward at a forward angle. By alternately heating and releasing the air and continuing the upward and downward slanting of the plane, the craft could be steered on a chosen course, providing adverse winds were not too strong. During the Civil War, an airship utilizing the slanting plane method of climb and descent was developed by Dr. Solomon Andrews, a physician, inventor of numerous devices, and three times mayor of Perth Amboy, New Jersey. While serving in the Federal Army as a physician, he saw Thaddeus Lowe's balloons in use and believed that a steerable balloon that could maneuver over the Confederate lines and return would be more useful than one that was attached by lines to the ground. Financing the construction of the aircraft himself at a cost of $10,000, he named it the Aeron. It had three cylindrical gas bags, each 80 feet long, and beneath was the car 12 feet long. During the summer of 1863, Andrews made three trips in it over New York City and vicinity. His method of steering was to tilt the whole craft by moving a weight to the rear of the car, slanting the front end upward as he released ballast and steering with a the rudder. Then, at altitude, moving the weight forward and releasing gas, the nose would incline downward as the craft continued on course. According to contemporary accounts in a New York newspaper, the air line rose more than a thousand feet and maneuvered against the wind. Andrews' efforts to interest the government in his invention were disappointing. President Lincoln heard of this airship and asked for further information, which Andrews sent to him, but it failed to reach the president. Using an operating scale model, Andrews demonstrated his invention to members of Congress, and then at the Smithsonian Institution, where Secretary Henry prepared a favorable report addressed to the Secretary of War. But by that time, the Civil War was drawing to a close and no action was taken. Meanwhile, 20 years earlier in France, Henry Giffard had developed the first steered airship using mechanical power. The gas bag of his airship was 143 feet long, 39 feet in diameter, and held 75,000 cubic feet of gas. Propulsion was by a three horsepower steam engine driving a three braided propeller at 110 revolutions per minute. To reduce the risk of sparks igniting the hydrogen gas, the car was suspended about 20 feet below the horizontal pole under the bag. Giffard's first trip was on September 24, 1852, at Paris, starting in late afternoon and continuing until nightfall. His speed was about five and a half miles an hour. He was able to steer to right or left, but could not make headway against an appreciable wind. He had plans for a much larger airship but his failing eyesight prevented him from completing that project. In 1872, Dupré de Lhomme of France launched this airship. It was propelled by eight men cranking the shaft of a large propeller, but its speed in a calm was only six miles per hour. A decade later, the brothers Gaston and Albert de Sandier, also of France, developed this craft. It was the first airship to use electricity the motor being of one and a half horsepower, supported above the geared propeller shaft. The speed of the airship was about eight miles per hour, too slow for practical use in more than a slight breeze. The first persons to construct an airship that could return to its starting place against the wind were Captains Charles Renard and Arthur Krebs, who developed the airship La France at the French aeronautical establishment at Chalet Moudon. The gas bag was 165 feet long, and the power was a nine horsepower electric motor weighing 220 and a half pounds. The batteries were devised by Renard. On her first voyage, August 9, 1884, this airship traveled four and a half miles in 20 minutes, making several turns in the air and returning to her hangar. She returned home in five of seven trips. Twice she was tied down until repairs were made or the wind subsided. On her last trip, she averaged 14 and a half miles per hour. In Germany, Heinlein, Wolfert, and Schwartz were advancing the art. 
Payne Line's airship, made in 1872, was the most successful of the three. It was powered with a Lenoir gas engine, the fuel being the gas with which the bag was inflated. Wolford's airship in 1897 was the first aircraft to be powered with a gasoline engine. But in the last of several trials, the fuel ignited and Wolford died from his injuries. The Schwartz airship, also of 1897, was the first to use the form of construction known as rigid, its bag having an internal framework formed of aluminum tubing and the outside covered with sheets of aluminum. Unfortunately, its trial, after four miles through the air, ended with a crash landing. In the United States of America, there had been several ideas for dirigible airships. Rufus Porter, who founded the Scientific American magazine in 1845, demonstrated his idea with a scale model, which he flew indoors, advertising his plan for an airship to be 800 feet long, which he said could cross the continent in three days. This was during the time of the gold rush. This is one of the many shares of stock that he sold. It is dated 1852. The full-scale airship was never built. Frederick Marriott in California, 1869, thought of getting added lift by attaching a delta wing to his gas bag, but gave up the idea after several disappointments. The first American airship that did carry a man was made by C.F. Richell of Connecticut in 1878. It was powered by the pilot's arms, turning a pair of cranks attached to a sprocket, chain, and drive shaft, extending to the propeller, which was steered by his feet pushing pedals and rods to turn the propeller pivot from side to side. Richel made several steered ascensions indoors, but during an outdoor ascension, the craft was blown several miles away before the pilot could make a landing. There is much more to the story of balloons and dirigible airships. We have brought it, in this film, close to the end of the 19th century. We have seen this vertical balloon develop to a practical form and applied to a number of uses. We have also seen that dirigible airships of the 19th century were made in a variety of sizes and shapes, but were limited in performance. I plan to continue for you the accounts of later than aircraft in the 20th century, but for our next film, I want to turn back the calendar to the final years of the 1700s, and then through the following 1800s to tell you of mankind's progress with the other form of aircraft, those that are heavier than air. That story is also a very interesting one.